He called it a village in heaven, and by that he didn't just mean that it was heavenly, which it is, but Stanley was a bit of a visionary, especially in his younger years, I think, and he almost felt that he could find heaven itself within this village, within its streets, its buildings, the riverside, the meadows, every bit of it. Stanley Spencer, you know, loved with his whole soul, really. The Jubilee Tree, 1936, is, is another typical Stanley Spencer work. It's not usual in any way. When you look at it, the, t the tree is very tiny, and what you see is the metal surround. That's the, you know, the feature that you see most of all. But for Stanley Spencer, everything was beautiful, and the metal surround will have been as beautiful as, as the tree. The tree, of course, was really only very tiny then because it was planted in the year before, in 1935, for the Silver Jubilee of King George V. And if you look at it now, it's the most massive, massive tree. Really shows how, you know, time has passed. This is a massively exciting season to be with us. Um, you could almost say that the last two years have all been about preparing for this moment. So we spent the last two summers getting our head around what is lurking in the paddock area, this green space. Um, and we've kind of got a vague idea or a very basic idea of the archaeology that lurks out there. But things are beautifully poised because we, we know enough to be able to really go for a strategic approach to uncovering the archaeology this year for the first time. So you will be playing a part in really getting to understand the amazing archaeology that we've got at this site properly for the first time. You will all make a contribution to that, to that voyage of discovery. So for me, personally, this is the most exciting season we've had so far. Um, and I can't wait to really get going and to get my teeth stuck into the hugely important stuff that's lurking out there. Bookham Arts Club was started in 1941 when artists came out from London to escape the bombing and because of Stanley Spencer was here and, you know, he, they knew, knew him. Quite an artist's group was, was built up and that's when we started. And uh, so we use all of Cookham to, you know, for our venues. And uh, we've been here ever since. <laughs> I've always sketched but I've never had time to do much painting because I was working full time. Um, and so a friend introduced me to Cookham Arts Club when I retired and uh, I've never looked back. <laughs> I've enjoyed, it's a very sociable club too and uh, I've really enjoyed every, every bit of it. I like doing a variety, so landscapes, buildings, sometimes um, sea scenes. Um, and different mediums too. It's nice uh, sometimes doing watercolour and then another time you can be more free with doing in acrylic paint or, or doing pen and ink. Um, and it's the workshops help a lot uh, that we have uh, four times a year because you try new things and new, new techniques and that makes it interesting. We've got about 140 members, you know, when everybody's joined, as it were. 
and uh, they're all different. And uh, at, on our Tuesday afternoons, every fortnight, we have an optional topic, and we all, you know, most of us have a go at doing the, the topic, the subject that's been chosen. And then when we've painted it, we have a, a, a friendly appraisal, and we put all the paintings out. And it's interesting to see all the different approaches that people use to the same subject, different mediums, different colours and uh, it makes it very interesting, yes. Um, we're just um, trying, to, trying to sort of consolidate what we can see. Um, so there's loads of different contexts um, different coloreds along the, the bottom of the trench. So we've leveled it all off and then you've got different surfaces and textures of surface and color of surface. So we just, when you came to get me, we were just, everyone's draw, sort of drawing what they can see and then we'll sort of compare them all and see how we're gonna plan it and then what we're gonna do next. Up until about five past nine this morning, the working hypothesis was that the river was gonna come up to, in, in the trench there, there's like a, the end of a stone feature, um, clearly man-made, shaped flit, that sort of stuff. And we were thinking that everything sort of beyond that was fill. And what we were gonna do is try and go down to where we could start seeing the settlement slope away. Five past nine, the first second mattock stroke of the morning, straight into an Anglo-Saxon midden at the, ed the very edge of the man-made ditch at the end of the trench. So that was like, you know, instant plan B. Yeah. So all we did then was just cleared off and leveled everything to flatten it, basically, so that we can see all, again, all those different contexts and colors and what's in there. And hopefully from that, we'll make a plan to, you know, we'll make a plan and then that'll give us a plan of action as to what we do next and where we go from there. When I'm watching them cleaning back the top layer of the um, trench too, which is a burial site, I'm watching them work across grave cuts that you can begin to see. Um, and I'm watching their shadows, their alive shadows, walk, uh, going across, gradually working across these grave cuts. And I find that contrast visually very interesting to see. And I'm still trying to work out how to do, put that in a drawing, but I have had a go. and. You know, and then talking to um, specialists afterwards about, you know, well, that's what I'm looking at. It might be that they've been studying this and doing this for years, but they've never looked at it in that way. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in the, the contrast between the living and the, and, the, and the past lives that have happened here. The first version was slightly bigger and it was um, more summery, so the sky was blue and the sun was out. And it was exhibited at um, the uh, Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. Stanley Spencer will have walked past that angel as a tiny tot with, with his father when they used to walk in the churchyard. And you know, as a grown man, he will have been so familiar with that, with that angel. Why did individuals build sites like this? You know, why would you have built a pseudo market town on a river? And how would you have interacted with it? How would it have changed the way you live your life? Because it's a very radical departure from what most people in the time period are doing. Uh, you know, most people are farmers. Um, they live very rural, relatively isolated, although I say that slightly trepidatiously, lives. Um, they're certainly not living in the sort of big urban centers of the Roman Empire or anything like that. 
uh, and so to choose to live like this, it would have been a very significant departure from the life that you know, from the life that most of your peers lead. So I find that utterly fascinating, uh, finding out why and, and how people uh, live like this. It's quite an intimate thing to do, to put um, sort of face paint, crack face paint on someone's hand when they've only just arrived on site, and to ask them their name, their role, and why are they here. <laughs> it's, it's quite searching. Um, but it gets a bit of chat going, and some really nice conversations come from that. So that's my first opportunity to get to know people. Um, and then I watch the engagement, what they choose to do. So some might feel more comfortable in the visitor's tent and some are happier just matticking or, you know, so there's personality comes out through what they're doing as well. Obviously their hat choices is quite important too. So, and, and their hair colour choice even, you know, it, there's, there's little things that, you know, bring about sort of a quirkiness and things. Is, as well. But the other thing I really like is there's some specific laughs that happen on site. Some people have really good laughs and there's a lot of laughing on site, um, a lot of chit chat um, that, that can be deep one minute, very profound and then quite bizarre the next. Um, but the, yeah, the laughter, just hearing it, I mean Rory in the bushes um, doing his tank, um, flirtation tank. You know, you know where he is because you can just hear laughter coming out of the bushes, so it's a distinctive laugh. And then there were people with distinctive laughs last year who aren't here, so I'm missing those. Um, but there's new laughs that I'm noticing, so that's, that's really neat. So that's before I even start drawing. I have to confess, I moved here um, when I had a small child and we tended to do small child kind of things. So I'd lived here for quite a few years when I actually took visitors um, to go see the gallery. And I mean, it's, I'd seen his work here and there before, um, but I think seeing it possibly in, in real life, I just connected it with it. There was such a sense of it's the, the spirituality that he embraces in such a humble and everyday way, which for me is um, particularly resonant. My work is, it's very spiritually driven. And yeah, it was just beautiful. It was the, the humility with which he would approach really heavy topics. And, and he's also a figurative painter, you know, so it's, it was just a delight for me to discover him. I didn't want to be on this dig just because it was five minutes from my house. It's not about it being convenient. Um, so yes, I happen to be a local artist and I, and I very much love being in Cookham. I find it a lovely place to be and to create work. Um, I think a lot of creatives do. Um, but the history aspect of it was really important to me. Um, and I was getting interested in what a find um, might say about an event, a situation, that you can build a whole story by looking at something and thinking about how it's shaped. So I was already thinking in that way and looking at um, discarded items, rubbish and things around, um, like a fairy cake case being moulded by somebody as they fold it after, after eating it, after they've had that special moment of eating a cake. Um, and that would be, that might have a thumbprint in it and that links to me to the first time I ever held a flint and felt the shape of someone else's hand that had um, modelled that. So I knew I was interested in archaeology, so um, that was very much why I came here in the first place. But coming on site, um, yeah, it, it just feels, I've summarised it, first of all I was overwhelmed by how many things there were to look at, and my first sketchbook had everything in it. 
And then I needed to sort that out in order to progress my work. Otherwise, I'd just be keeping just drawing anything I saw, and I wanted to make sense of it. So I started to use three sketchbooks for one for fines, one for people, um, and one for the changing landscape. So from that, that really helped to work, have a working method last year, and that really links in if I think back to my practice and, and development I did a degree in theatre design and I started to see the changes to the day you know the way that they would drag the black plastic off the trench at the beginning that's like the beginning of a play starting you know and and then the people walking around and the different props that they need at particular times and the conversations that were had um, but also the shifting narratives as well about you know when they find something, um, they create, they use their knowledge to work out what it is and why it's there. And then they might find something else which changes that story. And again, that's, that's to do with theatre, that's to do with plays and, and narratives that, um, that I've been involved with before. So I just felt like I was in the middle of a set and um, that was very exciting. And, and recognising that helped me to feel at home here.